going to talk about this thing, Church on the Rock. And so we're going to talk about Church on the Rock. And, and I've really just introduced it. Because Peter is, he's recalling back on a memory of what he had this discussion with Jesus back in Matthew in the gospel where they had this conversation in Matthew 16. So he's kind of telling the church today what this is. And so he's really in this, he's talking to these people that are in distress. He's helping them understand who they are, the people they are, the purpose they have, and the privilege, the privilege they have. As believers, sometimes we don't understand how privileged we are as believers. And so he does that conversation with a lot of identity right there. So the first thing he's going to start with is the foundation. And he already started that because Peter's already learned this whole idea of the foundation of the church. But here's what we're going to figure out. Because Peter said he's a living stone. So what we know is this is a supernatural foundation. It's not built with human hands. It exists in the spirit of God. Not only is it a supernatural foundation... But it's extremely valuable to God. Look at what he says there. He says, and in coming to him as a living stone, that's the supernatural because stones don't live. We've often heard that dead as a rock. Y'all have heard that. So as a living stone, it's supernatural. But now look what he says, which has been rejected by men, but it's choice and precious in the sight of God. So he's saying this foundation, who is Jesus, is precious and matters most to God, valuable to God. And here's what I tell you today. If Jesus is not the most important and influential person in the church, you can have a gathering of people, but you don't have a church. You understand that? Because the church is founded in Jesus on the rock, the living stone. And if he's not the most influential, the most important person in this church, congregation today then all we're doing is getting together that's one of the issues in the consumer driven church where we're trying to figure out how to serve people and make them comfortable so that they're going to come here the problem with that is this it's not about it's not about us it's about him you're here today to learn about Jesus to worship Jesus y'all get that now, we want to we be of service to one another, but in serving one another, we got to serve Jesus. Because if in serving you, I'm not serving him, then I'm, I'm a restaurant. Okay. So it, it's this foundation, the foundation of Jesus, that determines everything else about the church. The operation, the organization, and everything about it is founded in Jesus Christ. So now, not only does he talk about the foundation of the church as this living stone in Jesus, he's going to talk about the service of the church. So as believers, what we find out here in verse 5 is that we have the same nature as Jesus. Why? Because he tells us the same thing. You also as living stones. So how are we living stones? Because we have a relationship with the living stone. So the same nature that's in Jesus is in us. Because he's calling us in that nature, he's using our nature name, and you're being built up on as spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, now, check this out. Now, let me just stop right here. Because here's the deal. Most of the time when you hear sermons about church, you, you, you're sitting there thinking, oh, he's supposed to get on us about our attendance and all this kind of stuff. Uh-uh. This is, not a, this is not a sermon about church attendance. I'm going to mention something about attendance, but this is all about attitude and your service and who you are, okay, as the church. Now, there's the church gathering, but there's the church going, and we ought to go in the same spirit that we gather. You got it? In other words, we don't check our Christianity at the door of the church. We ought to be just as churchy. Oh, this is good. We ought to be just as churchy outside the church as we are inside the church. That's a good word right there. Because people think this idea, that, that with this whole idea of the church, well, that's kind of churchy. Well, I take it as a compliment because what you're telling me, if I'm doing it right, I understand 
I understand. Now, we ought not to go around talking about these and thous and all that kind of stuff. And I'm saying that. But I understand. But if you're calling me churchy, I take that to mean you're calling me Christly. Because as a church, I ought to be in the nature of Christ. Why? Because the body ought to be like the head. The head is Jesus. So if Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, I ought to be looking like and acting like Jesus. Right? Okay. So as believers, we've got the same nature. This is why it's so important that we recognize the supernatural existence of the church. The foundation of the church is the same foundation that we as Christians have. So the living stone that is Jesus for the church at large is the living stone for the Christian individually. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus. Same conversation. Paul and Peter on the same page talking about the foundations and who's building it. Now, the work of the believer and the work of the church. And this is so good, you've got to pay attention here. The work of the believer and the work of the church will be a judgment of quality and not quantity. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. And, and now listen... And this is why you need to understand that every, everything, <clears throat> every jot, every tittle, every parcel of Scripture matters. And this is where we kind of read over things real fast and don't gravitate to the meaning. Each man's work, did y'all see that? Each man's, individual, that's an individual term there, each man's, okay? Each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each, there it goes again, each man's work. So here we have, we have an individual responsibility to, uh, an individual accountability to a corporate responsibility. Because he tells us in this text, it's built as a spiritual house, that these are rocks upon rocks. So there's a building. So we're not independent because no brick independently is any good by itself it has to have other bricks in order to become a building y'all see that an independent rock laid on the foundation of Jesus has to have other rocks there has to be a laying on there's that corporate responsibility but each rock is accountable for being a rock now for some of y'all that shouldn't be real hard are y'all with me because y'all already Rock. Y'all missed it. Y'all kind of like a rock. Hard-headed. Rock. Just saying that. That didn't go real good. So the question we ought to ask is, how do we produce quality work? How does the church produce quality work? How do I, as a believer, produce quality work that's going to go through the fire of judgment and come out on the other side? Because here's how we think most of the time. Oh, gosh, God's going to put a fire on me. He's going to discover all the stuff. What he's motivating us to do is to recognize God's going to be a fire on me. I need to be about the right stuff. Instead of being scared about what he's going to discover, we ought to be motivated by what he's going to discover. You understand that? But what we do is we live in this fear of judgment instead of the expectation of reward. So I can always go back to an athletic context in this for me that's easiest. So here's what I did. I worked and I practiced hard so that I could earn the right to play and compete for a prize. I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared of failing. I was motivated by winning. You all understand that? So the issue is I, I want to go for a championship. So I'm going to do what I got to do 
to be prepared to win a championship, to prepare with my teammates because I want to play well for the team I'm on. I want to play well for the school I represent. I want to play well for I want to do that because I want to win and I want to be, I want to live in anticipation of the prize that I'm going for and not the loss that could occur. Too many people are trying not to fail and not living to win. We're so afraid that we may be accused of being a bad Christian that we don't do anything about what it is to be a healthy Christian. It is imperative if you're going to do good works, quality works you can judge on. I talk a lot about this. I talked about a couple weeks ago our identity in Christ with this warfare stuff on Wednesday nights. It's imperative that you know your identity. So look in verse 5. He talks about our identity. He says you're living stones. That means you've got the same nature as Jesus. He says you're built up as a spiritual house. That's Christian or Christianized, if you would. In the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. That you're a holy priesthood. Peter is speaking of the high priest who have access to the Holy of Holies. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy, holy place by the blood of Jesus, means we've got a passport to enter in. We don't have to wait anymore because under the old covenant, one priest had one day, the day of atonement, in which he could go into the Holy of Holies to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. There was one day. But now, because he's talked about this in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, about the blood of Jesus and what it does for us, that blood allows us to access the throne anytime and we can come boldly Hebrews 4.16 says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What am I saying here in this function or this service of the church? What I'm saying is this. And what Peter is saying is this. When you recognize the nature that you have as a living stone built on the living stone, You'll be able to be exactly what God's called you to be as the church. As the church. That he's built you up. And he's given you the identity that you need, that I need, to be the church that he wants us to be. It's not that I'm trying to be something and go, oh man, I'll never make that. It's that he's already made it in me. I have everything I need to be what he wants me to be. And now look, where is he asking them to be the church? In one of the worst environments in the world. They're under persecution. It's tough. And he's, he's, what is he talking about church? Because right here, the church becomes so valuable right now. And he talks about this spiritual service. What kind of spiritual service does that look like? Well, John MacArthur, you may have heard him. He's a pastor. He's written tons of books. But he's got a commentary. And he finds at least seven, and I'm not going to go elaborate on all seven of these, so calm down. I realize the children are here. But he said, there are seven things, there are seven things that we're looking at that make part of our spiritual service. Our bodies, our bodies represent spiritual service that we're acting out, that we're physically acting out in spiritual service. Our praise, that we praise God. Our good works. Our generous giving. The converts that we reach for Jesus. Our love for one another. Our prayers, that's all a part of spiritual service of what we're doing here. So we look at it. So Peter is being empowered and enlightened by the Holy Spirit as he writes this and he talks about this, this whole issue of the spiritual dynamic of the church. See, there's a, and, and God's taught me this in the last seven, eight years, Okay. Really, it's something I've known, but God has really put in me. Uh, as I got to travel around, going to different places with Bucky Kennedy Ministries and speaking at a, a couple hundred churches and watching and seeing what's going on, God really showed me, I mean, the difference between healthy churches and unhealthy churches. And it had nothing to do with the numbers. I, I mean, I got to preach in really big churches, thousands, 
And I got to preaching some small churches, hundreds. And can I tell you, there were some churches that had less than 100 that were healthier than some of the larger churches I was in. I mean, when you go and you preach at a really big church sometimes, not all of them, but there are some out there. I mean, they act like they're doing you a favor by having you there. That they're going to help you more than you're going to do anything for them. That bothered me. It bothered me. And, and so it just started pointing in understanding the spiritual nature of the church. That spiritually healthy churches that recognize that they are part of a supernatural ministry and a supernatural body doing a supernatural work are the healthiest churches on the planet and it has nothing to do with the number of people that are in the room. Now here's the reality. If you have a large number of spiritually healthy people, you know what you're going to have? A lot more spiritually healthy people. Because spiritually healthy people go out and tell other people about Jesus, grow other believers and bring them in. That's just a dynamic. Y'all with me? I mean, that's just how it works. And if, and if you live in a heavily populated area where there are a lot of people to go and minister to, you're probably going to have more people just because of the number of people that live around you. And so when you're a spiritually healthy church in a heavily populated area, you should have a lot of people coming. Are y'all tracking with me? But the other thing is, if you're a spiritually healthy church in that community, your community ought to know your existence as a spiritually healthy Christian and a spiritually healthy church. There ought to be some dynamic of change and influence in the community that you're in. And the reason they were getting persecuted, the reason they were getting persecuted is because they were people of influence in that community. The pagans didn't like them because they were affecting, they were affecting the number of people coming to the temple and, the, and, and, and idolatry. They didn't like them. The Jews didn't like them because they were affecting the work of the synagogue. Rome didn't like them because they wouldn't bow the knee to Caesar. So who they were and how they lived was referenced in the community that they were serving in. So Peter, when he's writing this, he's not just writing something that he's certainly empowered, he's certainly enlightened, but he's informed by Scripture. Because he's talking about Scripture in verse 6, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious stone, a cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be, a, be disappointed. Verse 7, this precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very corner stone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, in that first part of verse 6, he's talking about Isaiah 28, 16. Then he starts quoting in verse 7, Psalm 118, 22, and in verse 8, Isaiah 8, 14. So he's going back to the Old Testament He's bringing all this stuff out of the Word of God to the people of God. So he's not making this up like it's never been there. Matter of fact, they were talking about this living stone some 1,500 years earlier. And now Jesus comes on the scene and they're talking about him. He is, he's saying this is the stone that the prophet Isaiah wrote about and the psalmist wrote about. This is the same stone we're talking about. And we're to be that church. And the reason we can be that church is the identity that we have. Again, well, I just talked about the kids. If you recognize who you are in Jesus, that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of, who, of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Because this is who you once were. So there's a before and after. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So here's what Peter's saying to them. Hey, understand who you are. And this is why identity is so important. Because when you know who you are in Jesus, you will know what to do in Jesus. And you won't be walking around like some defeated victim. I mean, I just say this, sometimes you ought to recognize, every once in a while, you just ought to sit back and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
I'm a, I'm a part of the royal priesthood. I'm in a chosen race. He calls me an overcomer. We are not victims of this world. And we've got this idea, well, the world's just, the world is attacking us. But guess what? They're attacking the winning. Something. They're not attacking somebody that's losing. We're winning. Matter of fact, we're not winning. We've already won. And they ain't even had an election yet. <laughs> But there is a rejection that you're going to deal with if you're living in your nature and your identity. The world's not going to like you. Because the value of Jesus and his church is found in our belief and obedience. In verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. You, you, you know who struggles the most with disobedience? And they stumble over the obedient. I found this out in my life. You know the people most disturbed by the boundaries I set are people who don't have boundaries. Those who don't have boundaries are often the most irritated by those who do. You understand that? I mean, I find that a lot of times because some, you know, I, they're just things I, I have to have boundaries in my life about time and money. They're just boundaries. You got to have boundaries. You ought to have boundaries in your life. Now, some of y'all get a little legalistic about it, and I understand that. But you ought to have boundaries in your life. There ought to be things in your life, and, and sometimes people won't like it. I like to go to bed early. I do. My kids come up to the house, and they come up there late. Is this not true? Not you. Not you, Hannah. Okay. Well, wow. Wow. So we know what child we're talking about now. <laughs> so if that child comes up late, you know what I'll do? Even with the baby, I'm going to bed. Now some of y'all right now, you're like, oh, man, that's so, that is so rude. You're not the first to say it. <laughs> you all right? I'm just sorry. I got to get to bed. I'm tired. So the later I stay awake, I'm more apt to do some things that are going to be ungodly. <laughs> Don't act like I ain't got no friends in the room right now. Now, some of y'all with little children, God bless you, you're in a season of testing right now because you're sleep deprived. Some of you mamas are sleep deprived. Amen. <laughs> right now, I woke you up, just say amen. That's what a good idea. <laughs> but there's some boundary you ought to have. I don't, for instance, there's a boundary. I don't go out by myself with a woman other than my wife, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, or my mama, or my sister. Let me put it out there. I don't go out with women that I'm not related to by myself ever on uh -uh, no way. Now, sometimes I guess, well, I just... Uh, are you just scared women just can't? Handle? I'm not scared about the woman, but I've just got too many instances where some people walk in and they'll see me with a woman that's not my wife, and I'll, I'll be there and I'm having dinner or lunch or something with them, and Stacy's not there. You know what that does? Oh, look at the preacher. Who is that? that ain't, I don't think they're related. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. Listen, and listen, y'all know why the enemy's called the accuser of the brethren? He don't need evidence. He just needs opportunity. That's a boundary I have in my life. Y'all ought to have boundaries that are there and, and are in place in your life for how you live and what y'all do. And so what happens here is these believers are having boundaries in their life. They're obedience to God. And that's causing unbelievers and people on the outside to stumble over them. And they get rejected. So Peter's writing this to believers in five different regions. He's, and he's holding them accountable to the same standard. See, I believe as the word of God becomes less and less acceptable the church of God becomes more and more valuable to those who are in it. 
because you're going to come under attack and you're going to need the encouragement. If you're going to live a godly life, you're going to need the encouragement of other godly people. And as, we're, as our world gets more and more dark and less and less truth, right now there's not a whole lot of truth coming out of the world. And there's truth ignored and then there's going to go truth attacked. And the church, the, the authentic, blood-bought, Bible-believing church of God stands right in the way, stands right in the way of a deceptive world. And in America, we are a thorn to what the secular world wants. Whether it's Democrat or Republican, Independent, Libertarian, whatever. And so you need to understand that if you're going to be a person of truth, you're going to become more and more rejected. And because of that, you're going to need the body of believers to encourage you more and more as you walk in truth. Because it's going to cost something. It's going to cost something. So God is not building a church for this world. He's building, a, he's building a people for the next world. This world is not our home. Because, how, do you, how do you know that, Bucky? Well, how can you say that? Because he says it in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. He understands we're in a war zone. But here's the cool part. Verse 12 is such a good, good word. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, they may because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. What does that mean, glorify God in the day of visitation? The day that the Holy Spirit starts convicting them, they're going to remember your testimony, and they're going to come to Jesus. The same people that slandered you, that stumbled over you, that saw you as being narrow-minded, all this kind of stuff, and slandered you to that, the Holy Spirit's going to come on their life and start working on them, and they're going to think about your behavior and the difference of your behavior in the world they're living in, and they're going to they're come to Jesus. Listen, but your behavior, which once was a stumbling stone to them, is going to be a stepping stone to them. And it, now, let me tell you what's going to be hard about that, because sometimes... And I've seen this happen. There'll be somebody get saved that just been a hard case. Said some mean things to mean people, you know what I'm talking about? Or mean things to godly people. And then they get saved. And the godly people have a hard time with it sometimes. Well, they said some hard things about me. I mean, we got them in here. They're going to have to come to church here. I got, I got to go to church with them. I mean, I... <laughs> It's always, everybody loves forgiveness until they got to give it. I mean, we all a fan of forgiveness until we have to offer it. We all about restoration until we got to be a restorer. I'm just saying. Don't we? I mean, we all love the values and the wonderful promises of God until they are on us. To act out in our lives. But aren't we in this way, aren't we to live in such a way as to win over those who aren't? Because I was one of them that was. I was one of those people who didn't know mercy until I got mercy. I was one of those people who walked in darkness until I came to light. And there were people, there were people that worried about me. They thought I was running a con, dead serious. I mean, they started a petting, a, a betting pool about me. Dead serious, dead serious. We were home one weekend, Stacy was with me. One of those guys in there, we got there, was at my dad's restaurant. We'd gone off to seminary and we were just home, I think. Either we just finished, moved back home or something. 
can't remember. But he was there, and he came up, and he said, he's drunk. He said, are you still preaching? I said, yes. I lost money on you. Now, Stacy said, yes, he's still preaching, and yes, you're still drunk. She, I mean, she can cut slack. So here's the deal. So listen, so there, there are people. I, I mean, the, I had a hard time, convinced, churches had a hard time being convinced, hey, do we, do we let this guy preach? Do we put him out there? I mean, the reputation was that. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them for that. I'm not, I'm not upset about it. But, but listen, Paul was the same way. They, they had a hard time with Paul. I mean, here's the guy. Wait a minute. Wasn't this the guy that was putting people in prison, persecuting people? And now y'all want me to love on him? Or y'all want me to let him preach? Y'all sure? You sure? Casey, I mean, you know. You can ask y'all out there. I mean, I had y'all up here a couple weeks ago talking about, you know, the drugs y'all were doing. Homeless, all the kind of stuff y'all are in. Now y'all, 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 y'all leading the ministry? Adam, I mean, Adam, listen, Adam. Hey, listen, no, 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 no. This is good. This is good. Adam, I've heard several people say, Adam, move at your church. They went to school with you. I mean, this is what they said. Man, I'm telling you, he's, he's at your church. That dude was jacked up. That's what they're saying. Did you know that when you got married? Like, you, know that? you didn't probably know that yet, did you? There he, he's in there. He's preaching, preaching funeral this week. In there doing celebrate recovery this week. I mean, can, y'all understand? Because there's some of y'all that we don't know your story. But if we did know your story, we'd probably, the people next to you might slide a little away from you. Amen. You all right? Because some of y'all done some things. Amen. And that, that, that's the church, isn't it? The church is made up of a bunch of rebel rousers and hell raisers and everything else that came under the mercy of Jesus Christ that became living stones that were nothing but dead rocks and now they're living stones. And now you get to worship together and now you get to be the church. And there's some of you looking at your behavior now because they knew your behavior then. And they're saying, if God can save that old boy, God can save me. If God can take that woman and make her new, God can take me and make me new. And the people who once stumbled over you are now stepping on you and coming to Jesus. That's the church. That's the church. But you got to live that way outside. You understand that? The greatest call of the church is that we live godly outside the walls. And then we get stirred up again to live godly outside the walls. You can't find much in here talking about the great worship services of the New Testament church. I I ain't found one bulletin mentioned in here. But you know what you find a lot of? You find a lot about the stories of the church outside the church reaching the world. You know why they were getting persecuted? It wasn't because of what they were doing inside the building. It was what they were doing outside it. And that's why you have to come together to be encouraged. Because if you're living righteously outside these walls, you're going to need the encouragement once you get in them. And there's sometimes you're going to stumble as a believer. You're going to mess up. And, it just, and, and, and they're going to say some things. And the idea, listen, we get so intimidated by this, and then I'm fixing to wrap it up. We get so intimidated by this, and it bothers me. We're so scared or, or, or acting like we're silenced because they, can, they point to some imperfection you have as a believer as though that disqualifies you from saying anything that's truth. Well, let me tell you something. 
The truth is not in me. The truth is in him. I'm not leading them to be saved by me. I'm leading them to be saved by Jesus. Now, I have a responsibility to, as, as to live out the nature of Jesus, but I'm not the one that saves anybody. It's Jesus. I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And I'm going to be a I said, you're right. I am not perfect. But the one who lives inside me is perfect, and that's the one you need. I know that church, yeah, they got some hypocrites down there. Come on, one more won't matter. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I mean, I'm just saying. You know, people go, well, there aren't no hypocrites in the bar. That's a lie. I was in them. Yeah, I, most hypocrite. I'm, I'm in that bar getting drunk. I'm just saying. When I was lost, I'm in the bar getting drunk. Tell me if this isn't hypocrisy. If I'm a, if I'm a genuine drunk, I got no reason to go to church and sing grace. That's hypocritical. You're denying your drunkenness. <laughs> Nobody ever called me a hypocrite for going to church. It's drunk. You're just a hypocritical drunk. But I'm a hypocritical Christian. Some of y'all, y'all's brain is cooking right now. It's on. <laughs> Hypocrites all over the place. But we get, well, I, I really can't say anything because, Lord, I've, I've probably done the same no, it's not about what you've done or I've done. It's all about what Jesus has done. Get over yourself and be godly, okay? And that's not a reason to walk around like you're not perfect, but the call is to be that witness and live in the perfection of Jesus and tell others about Jesus. Look, we've already decided that. Some of y'all messed up. I've got to finish. I, I'm just really, I'm just really, listen, okay, can we, just, can we just understand that? We're not perfect. But we're built on, on the stone that is. Amen. And if we just live according to the nature that we're built on, we'll be okay. And if we'll own it when we fail and then be just, oh, this is just lights me up. I got to finish. Because I'm telling you, this burns me up. And then understand, we ought to be the most forgiving, redemptive, restorative place on the planet. Because we know what it means. He said, you once were in darkness, but now you transferred to light. You once didn't know mercy, but now you know mercy. And I'm telling you something, if you've come out of darkness into light and you've been, you've been held in the bondage of something that wasn't merciful and you've come under mercy, that's the church. That's the church. And Jesus set that standard on the cross when he, when he looked down and said, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they do. What's your cause? For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a blessed day.